death. It's one of the few things in life that you can't avoid, along with taxes and plugging in a flash drive upside down on the first try. <laughs> Statistically, it can't be done. Specifically, this story is about the people who investigate deaths when they happen. And if you're thinking, I don't want to see that on TV, are you completely sure about that? Because death investigators aren't just supporting characters on some of the most popular shows, like Law & Order SVU, CSI and NCIS. Every once in a while, they even get a show of their own. Think you can get away with murder? Over her dead bodies. ABC's Body of Proof. Smart is always better when it's partnered with sexy Rizzoli and Isles. I'm New York City's top medical examiner. It's like I've been doing this forever. Well, actually, I have forever. Yes, forever. Which is also precisely the wrong answer to the question, how long was that show on television? <laughs> but... But it is not just TV death investigators who are very busy. In real life, every year, about 2.8 million Americans die. And most of the time, a physician is the one who writes what happened to them on the death certificate. But if someone dies under suspicious or unnatural circumstances, their body may be sent for further examination and possibly a forensic autopsy. That's what happens to around half a million bodies each year. And those investigations are incredibly important. A death certificate isn't like a degree from USC. It actually means something. <laughs> autopsy results have huge implications. Now, th there's the obvious one, like determining whether someone has been killed and, if so, how, but they also help identify new trends in substance ab abuse, uh, they warn us about defective products, and they can sound the alarm when they spot the spread of an infectious disease. And people who work in this field take that responsibility seriously. I mean, we're on the front line of what's being done, what's, what people are dying of. We see it every day, and we notice a trend pretty quickly. So we like to get the information out to the public as soon as possible so that other people are aware of what's going on. Maybe prevent a few deaths if we can. Right, that's a very important point about the public health role of her office, only slightly undercut by the skeleton of Santa Claus behind her, <laughs> who it seems for some reason died with his dick in a box. <laughs> and and while, while it would be great, if those autopsies were always performed and overseen responsibly, as local news regularly shows us, that is by no means the case. Tucked away in a storage unit in Pensacola, authorities found more than 100 human organs. The renter of the unit, former medical examiner Michael Berkland. The family of an elderly murder victim is not happy. Not at all. They found out that two now former GBI employees took a picture holding the dismembered head of their loved one. We can't show you that picture because it is too graphic, so we're only showing you part of it. Shelley took the Marine's brain home with him to Virginia, removing it from a jar and letting his kids play with it while his wife took pictures. OK, OK, so that's an appalling story for a number of reasons, but most of all, why did his wife take pictures? <laughs> what was she going to do with them? Post them on Facebook? OK, with what caption? Jackson and baby Tim Timothy handling a brain. Daddy's so good to them, always bringing home a new organ for them to molest. <laughs> hashtag growing boys, hashtag God is good. <laughs> and look, while those are just individual examples of what can go wrong, the problems are much broader, with reports finding many death investigation facilities are antiquated and in need of repair or replacement. And given how critically important those facilities are, it is shocking how often they're funded as an afterthought. Currently, the U.S. government provides virtually no funding to either medical examiners or coroners. One of their grants was for one office to get a new refrigerator because their current refrigerator was closed by a belt. <laughs> you know, that's how poorly funded. I myself have worked in an office where it was a converted garage with a single light dangling from the, from the, the roof a single light bulb over my uh, autopsy table. That is, quite frankly, too spooky. <laughs> if, I've, if I've learned anything from horror movies, it's that when you see a room containing one dead person, one alive person and one light bulb, that's a room that's about to contain two dead people <laughs> and one light bulb. So tonight, learn from movies. So tonight, let's talk about our death investigation system, specifically how it works, why it's such a mess and what we can do about it. And before we go any further, you should know that depending on where you live or indeed die, you could wind up funneled into one of two systems. Around two-thirds of the country's death investigation offices are overseen by coroners, while medical examiners oversee the rest. Now, you might think 
that those are the same thing. And, and they do have essentially the same job. They're responsible for deciding whether to have someone conduct an autopsy and then using it to rule on the cause and the manner of death. But there is a key difference between them when it, when it comes to qualifications in particular. While medical examiners are required to be doctors, coroners are usually not medically trained at all. In fact, in Georgia, out of 154 coroners, only one is a physician, while the others include grocers, farmers, handymen and hairdressers, which is a little bit weird. I mean, no disrespect to hairdressers, but some have been known to drop the ball from time to time. <laughs> it has happened. Mistakes have been made. And if you are wondering how the hell grocers and hairdressers became coroners, in Georgia, as in much of the country, coroners are actually elected. And the bar to run for the job can be very low. In fact, in Arkansas, there is barely a bar at all. You can run and be elected with zero medical knowledge, anatomical training, or official certification of any kind. You have to be 18 years or older, you cannot be a felon, and you're electable. Holy shit! Look to your right, now look to your left. Both those people are eligible to be, and indeed are, coroners in Arkansas. <laughs> and, and having elected officials with no medical training signing off on death certificates is frankly weird enough before you factor in the potential for some huge conflicts of interest. In some jurisdictions, the coroner is also the county sheriff, and that has led to some serious problems. In California, one doctor quit a county coroner's office, claiming that the coroner slash sheriff there had repeatedly interfered in cases where the police had used deadly force. Dr. Bennett Amalu, renowned for his expertise on concussions, accused San Joaquin County Sheriff and Coroner Steve Moore of trying to change autopsy findings in shootings involving his officers. That is obviously not good. It is hard to trust a death certificate in a death involving police officers when the guy signing it seems to have an active interest in the police not being culpable. It is also hard to trust it when the guy signing it looks like Marlon Bundo made a wish to become a real boy <laughs> and it backfired horribly. Now, now, that sheriff denied doing anything improper, but they've since taken coroner duties away from the sheriff's office, which is good, because you can't have any suggestion of coziness between death investigators and law enforcement. In New Orleans, their coroner for decades was Frank Minyard, who was criticised for frequently finding that people who died in police custody had suffered accidents. And when he was confronted over one case in particular, he got pretty annoyed. When the body of Henry Glover was found in this burned-out car, evidence pointed to police officers being responsible for his death. But Coroner Mignard did not classify it as a homicide. And so there was no criminal investigation. A burnt up body inside a burned out car? Well, to begin with, we... Behind a police station? Okay, look at it that way. Now look at it from my point of view. We can't say. There's no way I can say that that is a homicide. There's no way of telling how, why this man died. Except there absolutely is a way to tell how that man died. A medical investigation into his death, which happens to be your exact job. It's like hearing a clown say, look, there is no way to twist this long skinny balloon into the shape of a dog or a hat. Really, clown? If that's true, what exactly is the use of you other than psychologically damaging children for the rest of their lives? <laughs> and incidentally, that case was later reclassified as a homicide because of course it was. And when you take all of this together, it is no wonder that medical organisations have been calling for the coroner system to be abolished since 1857, <laughs> arguing that the person appointed should be a doctor in medicine. Essentially, the medical examiner system, which instinctively does sound much better, doesn't it? Although you should know, even this system is not perfect. Remember the place where staff posed for photos with a severed head? That was a medical examiner's office. The guy who took the brain home for his kids to play with? He was, and still is, a medical examiner. And that's not even mentioning the medical ex examiner at the centre of the most fantastic 2020 interview of all time. The other charge is that your dog ate one of the body's spleen, and then he also ate a kidney. Is that true? <laughs> Dr. Hearn, you don't want to respond. You can deny this if it's not true. <laughs> it's never happened to me in an ABC News interview before or since, but Charles Harlan fell completely silent. He didn't get up and leave, 
He just simply stopped talking. What are you doing? You're still on camera. I know he's not used to dealing with the living, but playing dead is just not a legitimate move here. The problem is, though, good medical examiners can be hard to find because it's not a job that many doctors want. You've already seen the problems of underinvestment in the facilities, but on top of that, state-funded medical examiners make around half the salary they could in other medical specialties, with little potential for tips from satisfied clients. <laughs> And that is, that, that is just if you're happy with any doctor in the job. The best case scenario is to have board certified forensic pathologists running these offices and performing autopsies. But that is not going to happen anytime soon because there is a dire shortage of those. In fact, there are only 500 of them currently practicing in the whole United States, which is less than half the recommended number. And when you combine this staffing shortage, with the current opioid crisis causing an increase in bodies that need examining, you get a system that is pushed well past its breaking point. In New Jersey a few years back, their acting state medical examiner resigned in frustration, citing staff shortages as one of the key reasons. I felt as I walked in the door, they didn't have enough personnel to, uh, to handle the load. You don't want to come to a family and say, I'm sorry, ma'am. I'm sorry, Mrs. Smith, we couldn't do the investigation that we wanted because we don't have the resources. Right. He wanted to serve people well, but he couldn't. And things have frankly not got much better in New Jersey since. So for the time being, if you do find yourself dying there, please write down whatever is killing you on a post-it note <laughs> and stick it to your chest. You'd really be doing their overstretched investigators a solid. Thanks. The, the resources crunch is so bad that some offices wind up outsourcing work to private contractors. And this is where this story gets absolutely incredible. Because let me just introduce you to one terrible example of this. In Missouri and Kansas, a number of coroner's offices wound up hiring a company belonging to this man, Sean Parcells, to perform autopsies. And why wouldn't they? After all, he's a guy whose actual license plate says autopsy. <laughs> That's immediately reassuring, isn't it? They don't just hand that out to anyone with a valid government-issued photo ID and $45. No! <laughs> Unfortunately, though, there were a few problems with Parcells. For starters, he's not a forensic pathologist. He's not any kind of doctor at all. And while he maintains that his firm employs doctors, he's been accused of performing illegal autopsies himself. And he has frankly left a long trail of problems behind him. Parcells has been accused of botching a murder investigation. We cannot use any evidence found from the autopsy in a court of law. And lying about his credentials. Did you think he was a doctor? Yes. Why? Because he said so. I tell people all the time, I almost became a neurosurgeon. That doesn't mean that I'm a doctor. That doesn't mean that I was in medical school. I really did almost do that. Wait. Wait. You almost became a neurosurgeon but didn't, which puts you in a special category of literally everyone on Earth except fucking neurosurgeons. <laughs> I can also claim I almost became a neurosurgeon, which is why my parents, and this is true, are almost proud of me. <laughs> and and if, if you are wondering why a county coroner office would hire Sean's company, remember, many of them are seriously strapped for cash. And one of them explained simply, it was the most affordable. And Sean's low rates become understandable when you see one of his autopsy facilities, which for some reason, he was completely comfortable letting cameras in. Parcells gave us a tour. He's proud of this back alley autopsy lab. So this is our, the autopsy suite. Okay. And, um, obviously bathroom. There's carpet on the floor, what appears to be a lack of organization, and this is how containers are labeled and stored. I don't know where, okay, she's over there, so just be ready. We agreed to not record a woman's body that was unwrapped and unrefrigerated in the back corner. The freezers. And it couldn't be because there's no walk-in refrigerator inside this makeshift morgue. Only two small freezers that could be purchased at any big box store. Okay, okay. So, 
What jumps out at me the most about Sean's tricked-out death hutch isn't the single Glade plug-in, or the name Sean surrounded by green hearts on the whiteboard, or the Tupperware containers of baked ZT and or human remains, or the ominous presence of what appears to be a spray bottle of Scrubbing Bubbles multi-surface bathroom cleaner, or the absolutely sick Lab of Nerds poster, or the even sicker Albert Einstein poster opposite the room temperature cadaver, or the desktop skull, or the unfolded beach towel, or even the wall to wall carpeting. No, what gets me is that even within a grifter's back alley autopsy shanty, the most objectionable item on display there is somehow that absolutely enormous soda. <laughs> what are you doing with that thing, you fucking monster? <laughs> this, this repurposed ramen container could, and, and I have to assume does, contain blood, phlegm, and embalming fluid, and yet it still would be significantly less nauseating than the possibility that he's drinking a 40 of squirt. That is. <laughs> That's just me speaking personally as well as correctly and objectively. But wait, <laughs> because there is even more here. Because Parcells has also gotten in trouble for autopsies he's performed, but performed through his private autopsy businesses, for which he often failed to produce any sort of report. All of which has led to him facing pending criminal charges in Kansas of theft and desecration of bodies. And all of this has clearly given him a bad name in the business. But. Rather than stopping what he was doing, Sean Parcells simply stopped being Sean Parcells and instead started working under the name Professor Lin. And, and when that reporter asked him why, his answer wasn't great. Lin was used as a nickname, honestly, I'm being honest here, because people would butcher my last name. I don't think Parcells is that difficult. It's not, it really isn't. But I've had people say, Purcellies, Parcellies. But when you're uh, so. emailing, you don't have to pronounce it out loud. No, no. Okay, so then why are you signing things Professor Lin? It's my middle name. I have I have that right. Okay. So first, that's clearly horseshit. And second, the only person who should be going by his middle name is Hugh Grant, whose middle name, and this is true, is Mungo. It's true. His actual name is Hugh Mungo Grant. And for some reason, he chooses not to publicize that like an idiot. You're looking a gift horse in the mouth, Mungo. And look, as funny as Parcells is, and he is distractingly, inconveniently funny, the reality is that he's botched multiple death investigations. And the only reason that he had the opportunity to do so was because of the big gulp-sized holes in our fucked up death investigation system. And the thing is, it is not just dramatic consequences of murder investigations being compromised or epidemics potentially being missed. Even just ordinary delays in processing death certificates can have serious practical consequences for families. Because ideally, you'd want a death certificate within days or weeks, but it can take much much longer than that. Just listen to one woman whose husband had passed away suddenly and who had to wait six months for a cause of death. They're not thinking of these families that are waiting in agony, waiting to know what happened to their loved ones. It's inexcusable. The holdup also left Sarah struggling financially because without the death certificate, she couldn't collect life insurance to take care of her family. I couldn't pay for the mortgage. I couldn't, I had to rely on donations from friends and family. To you, it's much more than just a piece of paper. Yes, to me, it, it meant moving on. That's awful. You shouldn't have to wait that long for something that important. It's not like making someone wait eight years to find out who wins the Game of Thrones. And don't, don't tell me who it is yet. I haven't seen it, but based on the season so far, I'm guessing it was Ed Sheeran. They, <laughs> they really know how to deliver for the fans, don't they? So, so what should happen now? Well, in an ideal world, no one would die. I'm certainly never going to, and at the risk of sounding too prescriptive, I don't think you should either. But <laughs> in a slightly less ideal world, we would phase out coroner's offices and replace them with medical examiners. You know, the thing that experts have been arguing for since the 1800s. And we'd have autopsies performed or supervised by board-certified forensic pathologists. But that is not going to happen until we address the huge personnel shortage. You can't hire forensic pathologists who don't exist. So, we need to find ways to, to incentivize med school students to become forensic pathologists by uh, paying them more and by properly funding the offices that they're going to be working in. And the crazy thing is, it wouldn't even cost that much. One study recommended bringing public spending on these offices up to a minimum of just $3.75 per person per year. That is less 
than the amount of money that we inadvertently annually donate to our fucking couch cushions. <laughs> and look, I know this issue is tempting to ignore. It combines two things that people hate thinking about the most. Death and municipal funding. And <laughs> nobody wants to contemplate their own death or the death of their loved one. So try and think about this in a more abstract way. Think about what you would want for a beloved entertainer. Not me, obviously, that's the worst <laughs> possible example. Think of Beyonce, or, or Ted Danson, or Glenn Close. Do you want Glenn Close to wind up in Sean Parcell's autopsy dungeon? <laughs> or having her spleen being eaten by a dog? Of course not! She's a seven-time Oscar nominee, and she doesn't want that to happen either, do you, Glenn? No. I don't want my spleen eaten by a dog. Show my spleen some respect. That's right, Glenn. Put some respect on her spleen. Put some respect on that woman's spleen. I would argue... I would argue that Glenn Close deserves three things. Two Oscars and not to have her spleen eaten by a dog. That's the very least America can do for her. And look, we can and we should improve our death investigation system for Glenn Close and for every other person in the country. Not just because it's important, which it is, not just because it could save lives, which it could, but because all it will cost us is roughly the same price as an extra large big gulp. <laughs> and now, this. And now, a message about the importance of death investigations from Tracy Morgan. Hey, this is Tracy Morgan. And can I talk about something for a minute? We all know that one day, we all won't be on this planet. We're gonna die. I don't know how I'm gonna die, but I know it's not gonna be by Walmart. When my time does come, I don't wanna end up in a basement dungeon on some dude's autopsy table, standing over me with a butter knife and a dull spoon and an ice cream scooper. I don't want these things. And please, please don't let someone take my brains home to play with. That's not a good thing. And I love this woman, and I'm telling y'all right now, I cannot have some dog out here eating Glenn Close's spleen. Glenn Close is an American treasure. I love you and Albert Knobs. That's why we need you here. All it's gonna take is $3.75 to save Glenn Close's spleen, <laughs> right? Don't you wanna save her spleen? $3.75, who don't got that? $3.75, that's all it takes. I'm gonna pack this shit up and get out of my house. <laughs>